This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers. And I'm Nate Blayton. And uh, our guest this week is Mark Mellitz, a famed composer who's been commissioned by almost anybody that you've heard of. Um, he also teaches composition and theory at University of Illinois, Chicago. Thanks so much for joining us, Mark. It's great to be here. Thanks. Yeah. So um, we, we've been talking, trying to get you on the show for a while, and we finally got it together on our end. So thanks so much for putting it together, even on your vacation, joining us from the beach house, I believe, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, no, my pleasure. It's great to be here. Yeah. And uh, and. And also, you've been busy. You've got a couple of recordings coming out soon. One that just came out, and then another one that's that's on that's due soon. Is that right? There's even more. It seems like this is a there's gonna be a lot that are coming out um, yeah. this year alone. Yeah. So, what all do you have going on, recording wise? Mm-hmm. Um, so the the one uh, so Flatiron, I believe, is is either out or just about to be out, and that's a piece that I wrote for of all things uh, a bluegrass string band. Yeah. And that's recorded by. This group called the uh, uh, the Expedition Quintet with Jake Sheps. Mm-hmm. Um, oh boy, there's another piece called Requiem from a Hummingbird that the Peabody Wind Ensemble recently recorded for Naxos. That'll come out soon. Um, Tachycardia, which is a, a alto sax duo that I wrote. Multiple recordings are coming out this year. First one is uh, Dave Camwell and uh, Stephen Page. A piece called Gravity for percussion quintet or quartet. Um, also multiple recordings coming out uh, by the end of the year on that one. Um, solo piano piece, Agu, is being recorded at the moment. Um, and there's a couple more. Wow, <laughs> it's a lot, it's a lot, year for you. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's a little surreal. It's a little strange. Yeah, the list just goes on and on. So, I mean, we, we've heard some wind band music of yours. I've heard some... Uh, string quartet and then saxophone quartet arrangement by our friends the h2 saxophone quartet yeah and um but this this stuff with the string band i'm particularly interested in because that's not like a regular classical composer thing to do working with these folk musicians what's it like working with the expedition oh my god it was so much fun it was so much fun yeah i mean and they say they think it's it's i mean they've been publicizing it as the first time a classical composer has been commissioned to write for a bluegrass string band, which may or may not be true. It probably is true. Um, <laughs> they're fantastic musicians. I mean, musicians are musicians across genres and across the world. It's like working with great chamber music musicians, only, only a little bit different. Um, they're a lot of fun. They're really energetic. They just, the, the process was a little bit different. Yeah. The process was actually a lot different. How uh, so? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, tell. the first thing is I'm, I'm writing, for, writing for banjo. Never written for banjo before. I'm running for mandolin. Never written for mandolin. Five string violin, the yeah. low C. Never mm-hmm. written for that. Guitar is the only uh, guitar and bass were the only instruments in the group that I've actually written for. But it's a very different technique and very different sound. So mm-hmm. I was working as I traditionally work in in trying to to create music, to create sound, to write a piece. Was a little bit frustrated. Came up with a lot of ideas. I liked some of them. Didn't like some other ones. Was sort of you know kind of struggling through it. Um, and then Jake Sheps, who's the, the leader of the Expedition Quintet, um, flew up to Chicago and played banjo for me and got right in front of me and brought a mandolin with him, too. And that really sparked a lot of ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the next step was he gave me some of these instruments. So I actually lived with them for a while. I had a banjo and I had a mandolin. I don't know how to play these damn things. <laughs> but I can like put them in my lap and just hit them for a while, and they start to vibrate. And when you yeah. feel... The instrument, you know, just making sound in your lap, everything changes. So then the music really, I mean, it's like turning on a water faucet. Ideas were just flowing, flowing, flowing. I mean, for me, all music and every, all, all music that I write always comes from the instruments themselves. I always think about the instruments themselves and try to write music that's as idiomatic as possible. And if you don't really know what a mandolin, how a mandolin works, how, how are you going to do that? So, so that was really, really helpful. So that was the first part of the process. Okay. Um, and generating ideas, but then presenting it to them was also different. I mean, I created a score in parts, as I always do, sent it to them. They started working, but it's not like the classical world. They don't necessarily read music. I mean, most of them, they all read music, but they don't necessarily read music so, or exactly like we read music, yeah, just right. a little bit different. And they, they use their ears a lot more than classical musicians use their ears. They really listen to each other like I've never seen before. 
So in rehearsal, there was one movement in particular that just, the way I had written down, it just wasn't translating well for them. And we were getting a little frustrated and trying to get the sound that I wanted. And then finally, I just went to the piano and started playing what I wanted them to do. And they all started, they just picked it up and started playing <laughs> playing the movement perfectly. Just from, That's amazing. Yeah. So then we just started doing it that way, play something for them. And they they hear, heard everything absolutely crystal clear and would even make note. As I changed note, they would change it like on the spot. Yeah. It's fascinating. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So I, I've, uh, I'm a viola player. This, that's how I've spent most of my time, but I grew up like playing folk music. With my, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've gotten to play a five string every once in a while though. And that's my dream instrument is getting right. a good viola sized five in, five string. That's, right. that's, yeah, that's going to be like, when I get that, then I'm going to make it big. It's going to be, yeah, amazing. man. I, then I mean, things are going to be different. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's the only thing oh. holding you back, Nate. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just need that E string. It's gonna be good. Right. But um, but I, I grew up playing um, folk music with my, with my family and my friends and and doing other other kinds of stuff. And especially in college, really tried to dig into the jam sessions and learning learning tunes by ear and everything. Right. And that's a big thing. And that that's really interesting that you found that in as a, as a composer working with them that like even kind of, changing the score and parts thing into a little bit more of a jam session setting that 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 worked yeah. well yeah, where we're like, that, yeah that one a couple of movements we really had to do it that way um, which kind of go up the flow i mean it's you don't want to fight the instruments right. and fight the the way they play and the style they, they play you, you know you need to sort of adapt and go with it yeah so and, uh, go ahead go ahead go ahead Dave. i was going to ask about the 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 musical content of the piece it seems like working with such an idiomatic i mean so the, when i think of instruments that are hard to write for the instruments that are the hardest for me to write for are the ones that are so specifically so technically specific right there's yeah. there's there, there there's so many limitations when you write for uh marimba or harp or guitar, harp, guitar. Uh, those are the ones. that, yeah. that are right. completely <laughs> unique right you can't like translate the things that you can translate the right. things that you know about writing for oboe to writing for bassoon or clarinet or flute to some to some extent but there's not as there's almost nothing like that for these instruments and i'm wondering uh how you, you dealt with some of that stuff um and and listening to the the bluegrass uh, i imagine you did a ton of bluegrass listening at the beginning My God, of this did pro I ever, pro yeah. process <laughs> and how much of the bluegrass language crept in just either through osmosis or through dealing with the technical what fors of the instruments yeah a huge question and um stuff i've thought about um so i'll try and tackle them in, in both parts so writing for the instruments themselves um, yeah, they're ver they're very different, and you know all composers were, were scared, crazy of the instruments you mentioned, harp especially and guitar, because we don't know how these things work, and they can do things that uh, that other instruments just just other instruments just cannot do, um, and they can't do things that most instruments can do, um, but luckily the saving grace for me in this piece is that I've written a lot of guitar music, and from writing for guitar um, that translated well. Obviously there was a guitar in the group, but it, it, it translated into banjo and it translated a little bit into mandolin. Mandolin is more like a half harp, a half guitar, half violin, mm -hmm. and I've written a lot for strings, a lot for violin. So that really helped me out. Um, they're great players, and you know they, they basically had to adapt, especially the guitarists. I think had to really adapt to, to the to the writing, um, probably more so than I adapted for them. Um, so that was one one part of it. And you're absolutely right; it's a little scary. Um, but the, the having written for guitar before that was really helpful, and then of course having those instruments that myself myself. Um, I mentioned before, I don't know if we were on the air when I mentioned it, about having those instruments. Um, yeah. Yeah, th that really, really helped. And I just literally would play things on the mandolin, like put my fingers there and see if it would work. And I figured if I can reach it and play it, he can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and went really, really slow that way. Um, and then as far as language itself, I, I write my language. Um, I've tried so hard not to, and I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. So I listen to a lot of bluegrass. Uh, at this time, I discovered the Punch Brothers, which, yeah. I mean, oh my God, they're just they're <laughs> really phenomenal, really, really phenomenal. So I listen to a lot of this stuff, but I can't write. I can't, I'm not going to be able to write that kind of, I tried, I can't do it. You know, I spend an enormous amount of time in Romania every year where I love, you know, I fall in love with, with Romanian folk music and gypsy music over there. And I, I've tried to put it into my music and it's just not, it's not me. It's not the kind of composer, it's not the person 
that I grew up in. You know, it's not the environment I grew up in. So uh, it's the same thing with that. It's the same thing with this, with running for bluegrass. There's no way I could actually start to write bluegrass music. But it, it definitely had a big influence on me. And you can hear in, in the recording of Flatiron, there's, you know, um, I discovered like techniques like, the, like a violin chop and a mandolin chop, which is a yeah. you know, specific technique. So I, I adapted that into, into the piece and tried to use it more of a percussion, you know, a percussion instrument. <laughs> I hope that answers. No, it's, it's a big, uh, no, I know yeah. no, it's a big question. I should have probably asked a few different questions, but that was, that was great. Should we maybe <laughs> listen to a little bit of this? We've got, we've got a recording, uh, that we can check out. So, so what, what you have is, um, is the, it's tension hoop, right? Which is, uh, I think, I have flat iron. I might yeah. have tension hoop too. Are right. those different? Tension hoop is the first movement of flat iron. Flat iron, like okay. a lot of my music, is just a suite of very short movements. Okay. Um, and tension hoop is the opening movement. And what you have is um, is this sort of almost final version. It's not mastered yet, and uh, uh, but it's close. Okay. Do you have anything you want to say to to maybe set this up more than we we already have, or there, you know the group expedition is touring it. Um, they're playing it, you know, right now. Um, I know they played it last night. Nice. Um, so, and they're they're playing this this piece at all at their concerts now. So, that, yeah, that's it. Excellent. So, here's an excerpt from uh, Flatiron. Uh, the movement is Tension Hoop by our guest Mark Mellitz, performed by the Expedition Quintet. <laughs> Music performed by the Expedition Quintet by our guest, Mark Mellitz. Mark, thank you for jo- for sharing that with us. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Got to hear a lot of those those techniques that you mentioned. A lot uh, yeah. the the way you use the chops, I think, is really interesting. It's it's different than the way chops I feel would normally get used. Maybe Nate, you can talk about that. You're you're the expert there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so like the placement within the beat and the the relationship between like playing a percussion like it's almost like you brought the chop in when uh she was playing like on top of everybody else where like right. i've i've heard the chop happen so much more 
like as a, an accompaniment thing. You yeah. like did lead chopping. It was sweet. Right, <laughs> right, right. And like chop fills. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. and that's exactly what I wrote in the part. I write chop fill or <laughs> fill with chop. Something. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. No, it was, yeah. it, it was really cool. And, and I don't know how much control you have over the, the kind of uh, the, the pitches that are within the chop that you can kind of hear a little bit of, but it sounded like there were some times when the, the, the pitch of the chop would shift around a little bit. Normally, you know, think of it as, as an unpitched thing, but it seemed to shift character in places. You, you are you're so in my head. <laughs> it's exactly. So what I did in the part was I gave a, a contour. So there were, um, in fact, sometimes there were no pitches. It was just uh, stemlets, just a stem without a note head on it, showing mm. a, con- a general contour of of the pitch area of where I wanted the violinist to sort of play. It's exactly what you you were saying. It just sort of it, it gave it sort of some high, middle, and lower range. And then sometimes I actually wrote in actual pitches, very few spots. And then other times it was just very it was free. It was as as she wanted to as she wanted to do it. That's great, and, and you can tell that there's a lot of stuff in there that's you, having heard other works by you. But then there's definitely those those moments that just feel uh, really at home in in the bluegrass style, and, and I would imagine a lot of that is um, the the listening that you've done, and then a lot of it is also these great performers. Um, um, you can, um, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm just glad to hear you say that because that's something I really, you know, we thought a lot about. I didn't want it to sound awkward. I wanted it to sound free, um, comfortable. Um, you know, but these guys are such amazing musicians. I mean, they really, they, you know, they, they made it their own. And um, I think it doesn't sound awkward because more more them than, than me. They play together a lot. They know how to play with each other. Um, so I think a lot of that comes comes from that. You know, and Jake Sheps is a, is if anyone is a leader of the group, it's him. And, and he's... Um, it's a tremendous musical mind and absolutely completely open. This is the guy that's arranged Bartok for string band. Nice. He arranged tight sweater. He arranged he's arranged my music before when I, I didn't think it was possible. And then he did it and showed it to me. I'm like, yeah. He has a, mm-hmm. a a mind that sort of just transcends a lot of genres. And um and I think because of him, they're able to sort of do this type of music in a very comfortable fashion. Yeah. No, there's a oh. there's a great video online of him like his one of his or part of his arrangement in a tight sweater. There's a video yeah. on Vimeo. But yeah, I've I've seen it. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's they do a cool presentation. But go ahead, Sam. Um, just listening to this, the the thing that comes to my mind is the idea of performance practice. So anytime you write for somebody, like to me, it, it reminds me of baroque music, sort of. Like they have some dynamic control, but basically to make it loud, everybody plays, and to make it soft, fewer people play. You know. Um, but you're always either counting on or trying to work against the performance practice. And this seems like a very interesting case where you, and it, it, based on the way you were talking about how they learned the piece, you sort of rely on their sense of performance practice of how things should go in a string band. But then you also defy those expectations in a way that makes it, you know, composerly with a capital C to me. <laughs> like having the chops not function the way a chop functions, you know. Um, I was wondering, did you find when you were, did you have to get them to let go of preconceived ideas about how things should go? Or did you work with that more or was it going back and forth? I think, you know, we both had to let go of certain preconceived notions and that, and we had them sort of meet halfway. Um, yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. I, I, you know, yeah, Baroque, I love Baroque music. I listen to Baroque music more than anything else. Um, I, you know. And that's there's definitely an influence from that. I mean, that's why I write in short movements. I think in in these suites from a broke influence. Um, so yeah, things like the chop, it, we we discussed that, and they have a certain way that they they use the chop, and it just it wasn't it really wasn't me, and it wasn't going to fit this the the style of music that I'm that I'm writing in. I wanted to borrow that technique and and sort of put it into to my music in my way and use it in my ways. I don't know any other way to write music. I don't even know how to write. I don't even know how I do it in the first place. So let alone <laughs> try to like write write in someone else some other style. It's impossible. So um, what I can do though is take take a technique from another style and put it into my own. That I can do. Um, they weren't expecting that, and they had to sort of uh, come halfway, and I think I had to come halfway as well to sort of let go a little bit of that. And in rehearsals, we did, and the chops got more and more free 
um, yeah. as as we rehearsed it. And it sounded more and more natural. That's awesome. Mm. Maybe we yeah. so maybe we could compare and contrast this with your experience putting together this uh, percussion piece, Gravity. Sure. It's, yeah, like so for mallet keyboard. Per, uh, instruments, I believe. It's a marimbas yeah. and vibraphones or something? It's two marimbas, two vibraphones, and I have an optional version um, for uh, a third marimba. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, uh, we, we've been listening to recording of this as well and it's, and heard some live versions, and it's, like, okay. it's a really interesting piece, but I imagine like the process of putting this together much, <laughs> must have been a little bit more of the traditional com composerly path, I imagine. I could not wait to write this piece. I mean, <laughs> percussion quartet for me, or, or in this case, quartet or quintet, um, nothing could be, I mean, I was just, I, would, I could not wait. I really just could not wait. I was very excited about when it came through and it was a consortium commission, which meant that there were all these groups who were going to be playing it in the first year, uh, yeah. which is very exciting. Yeah. Um, and that was actually the reason we had to have a quintet and quartet version. One, one of the groups, uh, Percussions Clavier de Lyon, was on the commission um, is a quintet only, and they only play as a quintet, and they they don't like to play in quartets or trios, or it only it only has to be a quintet. The commission was for a quartet, and f in order for them to be on board, I had to have a quintet version. So that made it hard to be able to write two versions that would work the same, you know, and both work. Um, but yeah, I, I like I like both versions um, a lot. But for me, writing writing for percussion, it's just like man, it's just like a kid in a candy store. It's just like <laughs> Dude, that's it's it's, it's like marimbas and you just like bang really hard on these things and 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 uh, oh yeah, it was I was very very excited, very very excited about it. Wonderful. That 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 is interesting though, making a a piece that can operate as one like with or without a fifth part. Like were 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 the, were the yeah. other four parts the same or like between yes. the two different versions? Right. So here here's what I did. It's exactly right. So the other four parts are exactly the same. Um, okay. And then the fifth part, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I love practicality, and I talk to my students all the time about practicality, and I really, that things have to be practical. So I wanted a quartet version where people could learn the parts as a quartet, and if a, if a fifth member was going to be added, then they don't have to relearn their parts. I'm always thinking about musicians and their time and what they have to learn and how much time they have to learn it. And sure no, they man, appreciate they had, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they had. So that's why I wrote it that way. It just makes it really hard to fit in that fifth part. Um, but um, I was really happy with how it came out in the end. Um, yeah. That the fifth part can be in or out. Cool. And uh, I probably yeah, slightly it's... prefer the the quintet version. I have to admit. It's all this yeah. funky bass stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the fifth part is is a bass marimba part. I mean, it's all low end. It's it's uh, ah right. Yeah. See that I, that I probably yeah. should mention. It's it's just <laughs> low end. It's all low end, and basically, it's doubling things. It's adding a little bit of a funky bass line, the music that was already there. It's yeah. the 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 bass marimba part is the kind of salt and pepper on the piece. Yeah, so it's it's adding the subwoofer to the the stereo piece that you already had. Egg, exactly. There you go. So, yeah. you know, poking around uh, this piece on the web, one thing that, that drew my attention right away was how thoroughly documented the process was online. Um, okay. And, and I didn't know that. So there's a, there's a tumble log about, the, about the, this oh. consortium. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, I have seen that. It's so there's in, and I would encourage people to go back and, and check it out. So y you were not very involved in the, in, in the, this, this uh, online stuff. No, I wasn't involved at all. I mean, um, that was all Thad Anderson. Thad Anderson was the one. I played Music for 18 musicians. It was either Music for 18 or Sextet with him. I played both pieces with him. I can't remember after which performance it was that he said, hey, man, I had this idea for something about a new piece from you. If you're into it, I'm going to call you in a couple months about it. And sure enough, he did. And he said, okay, I want to do a percussion quartet. And um, it would be a consortium and would get out. He would take care of everything. All I had to do was just write it. And uh, you know, that's, that's great. That's, that's how most of them actually worked for me. Um, so I wasn't involved at all with what Thad did with the online stuff and getting the groups together. Um, the only thing I did do, I guess, I guess was get this, that French group to, to be part because I was already working with them. Otherwise, Thad, it was really all Thad. Well, it's it's very cool, and I think uh, we'll we'll have links where people can check this out in our show notes. Um, but uh, the 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 collaboration among the performers that that are in the consortium is is really cool, and there's a bunch of good media up there. There's an, yeah. it, actually there's an interview 
uh, with you, Mark. With Thad was is is talking to you about the piece over over the internet that's up there that you can watch too. I don't know if there you're aware not. of that. <laughs> oh, that I've not seen. Okay, <laughs> it's, it's. I hate it when people find things on the internet with me because half the time I'm not sober and it's really embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> I, this, this seems very sober. Either that, or you can really okay. hold your liquor. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Like yeah, drunk consortium, like drunk history show or whatever. That'd be that'd be a fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's wonderful. And uh, I we've been fortunate for you to share us with us some of your other music as well. You've got an earlier piece from 2012 um, for Wind Band. Wind Ensemble, yeah. Wind Ensemble, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that project? Sure. So Requiem for Hummingbird was written as. Um, it was written as an. It was for the Society for New Music as an auction piece so they so the society for new music just wonderful wonderful group in uh in syracuse new york okay. led by neva pilgrim had this um benefit at the end of the year um and one of the one of the thing one of the uh things you could buy was a uh, mark mellis would write you a piece and what we had envisioned <laughs> was i was going to write a, a few measures of something for someone use their name in it or their birthday or Right, a short thing for piano, you know, right, ten bars or twelve bars, nice. right. But then um, um, the um, Cornell Wind Ensemble, um, Turner Johnson, you know, what I'm talking about maybe. Um, can't think of her first name at the moment. She was there, and she wanted to. She asked, "Well, this is great, but I want to commission a wind ensemble piece. Would that be possible?" Um, so of course everything kind of changed and there was a lot more money involved, but, but yeah, it, it, I did it. And that was the reason I did it. Uh, I did it for her. Um, and, um, and she did the premiere, uh, with the Cornell one ensemble. She's now in Georgia, uh, somewhere. I'm not exactly sure where. Um, so she, when, when she did a lot of one ensembles, took it upon themselves to do it. And, uh, and then Peabody recorded it. It's very short, man. It's this tiny little thing about a requiem for a hummingbird of like, I remember I was looking outside my window and there's these hummingbirds in our ba- previous backyard and they're flying around and I thought to myself, man, they're so fast and, you know, what would a requiem for a hummingbird be? Like if your friend, the hum- hummingbird friend died and you're a hummingbird composer, what would you write for him in this life? So it had to be really fast, but, mm-hmm. but you know, but slower than really, really fast. So that's, yeah. that's right. what this is. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> and because like if you and if you if you were the hummingbird, you like how much of your life would you devote to remembering yeah. the such a short life of this other person? That's yeah. really interesting. That's it. And the guy's just floating around. He's kind of going in around the cilantro plant that was back there. And I'm like, OK, that's it. He, what if he died? You know, the hummingbirds almost die every night. That's the thing. It's like a hummingbird goes into the state of every evening of just almost dying. And then they barely make it the next morning they wake up and all they have to do is just constantly they have to just constantly eat or they die it seems that like that would lend itself to your uh your penchant that you mentioned earlier of writing short works these short short things for, well, for but, such yeah, a, in my scale i mean yeah. in the hummingbird scale this this is a requiem man this is a big huge long <laughs> exactly, piece. yeah exactly but a bit and a half it's a long time <laughs> for 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 a hummingbird right <laughs> That's that's very cool. I like that. <laughs> now, Sam, uh, we we had talked about this, this a project a while ago that Sam was really excited about, and so I, I'll let Sam ask you about composing for for smartphones. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I was just wondering what you thought about the process, and and uh, like, were you excited about the opportunity at the beginning, or did you have to get talked into it? And and obviously, writing a short piece is nothing new to you, so just you know. Um, you're talking about the, the special quartet project. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 People have who been asking quart- me to write. Hmm? Who was the quartet? I forgot. Spectral quartet. Spectral, Spectral quartet. quartet. Yeah. yeah. I've been, yeah. People have been, asked, been asking me to write for, for ring, for cell phones, for ringtones for, for many years. I write my own ringtones anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when someone texts me, it's like, Nate, send me a text. And, you know, yeah. my, my, um, my, my phone has my piece called black as my as my ringtone for text um text messages um mm-hmm. and i take excerpts from my music and i uh i use them as ringtones all the time do you use like different ones to different, ones different people i usually have the ringtone the, the piece that i write for the person is their ringtone 
Ah, that's, that's awesome. awesome. <laughs> that's there my ringtone. For, thanks, Nate. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. So that's I uh, know it's 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 really um, yeah. Yeah, that it's, piece black is brilliant. By the way, too. I heard heard a lot of good recordings and, and seen some performances you. as well. It's a little surreal. It's been played at this point over fourteen hundred times. I mean, yeah. wow. okay, so a, an obscure piece for two low instruments. I mean, it's a little, it's a little weird, you know, but I, I love it. It's great. It's really great. Someone puts a new YouTube of it almost every week, say. Yeah. It's because there are a lot of serious players who play that instrument, those That's instruments, right. and want some music. And when you write a cool piece, there's going to be lots of people who jump on the bandwagon, you know. And they're, you know, and especially in the saxophone world, because it's been adapted for two Barry saxes, they are, oh, yeah. they're so warm with each other and so friendly with each other that if one, if they, and they're so hungry for repertoire, like you said. Mm -hmm. So when they find something, they call all their friends, like, dude, you got to play this piece. And, and they literally, they all start playing it. The sax, the yeah. guitar world is like that too. They're very friendly with each other. They share composers with each other. Yeah, nice. I feel like I'm a kind of a composer whore. I'm a, a composer slut. I've been shared with so many different musicians. <laughs> but sad. in a good way. Yeah, Mark Lawrence way. really gets around, yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> my students yeah. had something to say. Um, my students really make me laugh. Um, they they always comment on, on things like that. I have a um, – and I would like to talk at some point. We have a new composition program at UIC that I'd like to oh. plug. Yeah, tell us point. about That's it. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. Now is a perfect time. Excellent, excellent. So, yeah, so I'm, I teach at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, and we're starting a brand new composition program um, a year from now, starting starting a year from this and this fall. Um, and we're, we're super excited about it, to put put a, a very intense uh, com undergrad composition program in in Chicago. That's that's a little bit different than a lot of the programs I've seen. It's it's going to be based on working with real world people, and and I mean it's less. A lot of programs I see they talk a lot about music, but they don't actually make music. And I just want to make music, man. I mean, music is, I, I love sound. I love music. I just love creating something from nothing. You know, we just, there's sound, there's silence. I mean, there's absolute silence. And then we create sound in that silence. It's this, it's this incredible, beautiful lie. I mean, there was, there was empty there before, and now we're, we're putting, we're, we're putting some sound on top of it. Um, and in order to do that, we have to actually have really great, musicians to work with so and okay I, talking about music is wonderful but making it is is more important i think especially for young composers so the program that i want to develop is actually a program where we're going to have ensembles and residents like our first year this this coming year we have latitude 49 in nice. residence with us yeah so we're gonna have all our students write for latitude 49 and cool. workshop with latitude 49 yeah, so they can group. yeah they're amazing and they could write they can write pieces for them that are um, that are sort of halfway done and we'll, do, and we'll do workshops and they can have different versions so they can say, okay, cello, can you try that, that, that line, pizzicato, piano, right hand up an octave. And then they hear it. All these different versions they can work with, with latitude, um, whoever ensemble we're going to have uh, coming in. Um, and it's just a little bit different way of, of trying to, and, and just have them write a lot of music, you know, just have them write a lot of music. I had a great, um, really wonderful advice from, from an early teacher of mine, Sam Adler at Eastman, who once told me and a group of friends, um, he was looking at her music and he kept shaking his head. We were talking to him and he's like, boys, boys, you, you don't understand what I want from you. What I want is quantity, not quality. And we kind of <laughs> looked at him like, no, no, you mean, you mean quality. I know you were born in Germany. So you need, qual you mean quality, right? Not quantity. No, 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 no. I know what I said. <laughs> Tell me what I said. Quantity. He's like, just right. And that's how you're going to learn to do it. He's like, you're 19 years old. You're going to throw all these pieces away anyway. We're like, no! Of course, it's like, come on, man. This is like, this is my masterpiece. This is the second symphony I wrote this week. You know? Right. Like, yeah. No, no. Yeah. It's a, no, you that's... write music at that rate at that time because you don't, don't, you don't know. There's nothing stopping you. You don't really know what's bad anymore. You're just like, just writing. And he said, look, just keep writing, keep writing, keep writing, keep writing, and just write as much as you possibly can. And don't worry about if it's good or bad. And then uh, hear it played. And then you're going to learn that way. So you're yeah. going to hear it. And then you're going to make a decision. And then instead of revising, write another piece. Yeah. Said, Never yeah. revise, just write another piece. And then you learn from that. And then you learn from that. And it was the most, absolutely the most brilliant advice I've ever gotten because that's how, it's really how we all learned at that time. Um, was, it was great learning, studying with him and learning from him. Um, and that was perfect for form and technique. But when it came down to writing a piece, 
was just do it, hear it, and do it again. And that's what I want to do at UIC, have a lot of that, have the kids just write a lot, work with ensembles, have, work with really great ensembles, and develop this this terrific program that we hope is going to be, you know, have a lot of uh, Chicago interest and then national interest and then hopefully have an international draw for young for young uh, composition students. That's really that great because so often we focus on like the, 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 the process. I mean, the process goes from having an idea through everything up to having a performance. And in school, we focus on like the first third of that, right, of, of having the idea and then turning it into some kind of score and then maybe a little bit working with players and and hopefully maybe someday get it, get them to play it somewhere right but the whole thing is is like all the parts of that are are equally important and and you need to learn those other parts too and those other parts inform that very important first part where you're getting the idea and putting it together in in That's some right. kind of formal structure that's really great and i think it brings in a lot of um the the hip entrepreneurial stuff that everybody's talking right. about these days as well of 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 coming from an idea to an artistic experience for an audience um it, all the way through is 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 a very cool thing that that we talk all the time on the show about how we wish we had had more of that oh we absolutely were in school. absolutely and we're, and we're definitely going to uh, approach that we're doing it already now maybe these you know, these people are gonna have to make a living as artists and yeah. what does that mean these days? And and they have to sort of, you might know, have to think a little bit outside the box in order to do that. Writing music, I mean, or earning a living as a composer is getting harder and harder and harder. So yeah. there are other things that that are compositional that are, um, and yeah, and taking a piece all the way through, like you said, from an idea all the way through, and like an idea. So this is the other thing. My students get stuck on the idea. I screw the idea. It doesn't like the idea is nothing. It's what you do with the idea that's something. I mean, a good composer can take any idea and write great music from it. The better I, the idea, the easier it is, of course. But it's another thing I'm trying to get compo uh, young composers to, to just let go of is their idea. They they work so hard on creating you know what the piece is going to be about. I said screw it. Just write it. Just whatever idea it is, I'll help you you know, mash that and work it into a piece. Yeah. No, and when I say, when I, when I say entrepreneurial, I'm, I'm not just talking about business, but like the idea of a project that is, oh, okay. that is the full thing. Though the business thing is important and the earning a living is important, <clears throat> but the full thing that you were saying of, of the idea then getting all the way through to the end. And I, I totally agree that the idea is, like ideas are a dime a dozen, like actually sure, writing right. the thing. Like, yeah. Uh, and Look you, at Beethoven. Look at those ideas. I mean, what are they? <laughs> right. Ba -da -ba -ba. Four notes. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Like not not the greatest melody maker of all time, but he he made it work for him. Yeah. Imagine yeah. imagine yeah. coming into your your teacher and say, like, "This is what I made this week. I made this idea." Right. And it's those yeah. four notes. They do. They They're do. really good. Yeah. 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 It's really good four notes. You're gonna dig it. That was yeah. actually Beethoven that texted me by by the way. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> yeah I get these you drunk texts from him all the time. It's, oh, just, yeah. it's annoying. You know this this makes me think about how technology has influenced the way people learn art forms these days. In some forms, like photography, it's completely changed everything. Because I used to work at a camera store, and I was, you know, the guy people would ask stuff about photography, and they would say, how do you take good pictures? And I would say, take lots and lots of bad pictures. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that exactly used right. to be very expensive, because you'd come in and get your photos processed, and that's a lot of money. You take thousands of pictures to see how to not take bad ones anymore, but now you shoot the picture, you turn your camera around, and you look at it, and you do that 5,000 more times, and all of a sudden, you can take decent pictures. Yeah. Certainly, uh, notation software and stuff like that has made some of that possible for composers, but not to that extent, not the completely realistic generation of an image, you know. And the idea of having an ensemble to really let yeah. students bounce ideas off is really the only way we can come close to that kind of immediate feedback situation. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. It's the shots on goal theory. So my brother Arnie, who's here with me, I have two brothers, Kenny and Arnie. I mean, Kenny's house and Arnie is uh, in, our, in my house. Arnie has a shots on goal theory that he's explained to me. He coaches little kids basketball. And he had a team once. The team was, well, they, they were really bad. They were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> They're just terrible. So at one point he said, look, don't worry about anything passing. Just as soon as you get the ball, shoot. <laughs> just just yeah. shots on goal. Just keep throwing the ball at the hoop. Eventually it's going to go in. And, mm -hmm. and it did. And that was their, like, shoot, shoot, shoot. And eventually they, they actually started scoring baskets just because mm -hmm. of, you know, by luck. 
Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I another thing when you describe this this partnership with these ensembles to me, the other thing that immediately s- struck me was how valuable that could be for the composers' careers to develop those relationships. Right? To uh to um you know, be working with those level of of, of performers on a regular basis. You mentioned that you had been playing a thing with Thad Anderson and then Thad came and said, hey, we should work on a piece together. And that is an opportunity that your students might have with these ensembles, right? When these ensembles are no longer in residence and those, these students are doing other things, then maybe that ensemble comes back and says, hey, remember that, that thing that we worked on together when, when we were at, uh, at Illinois? We should, we should do another thing. We should, we should right. work together on another project. And I feel like that could be a, a really valuable part of it as well. Yeah, and it happens all the time in reality. Sure, I mean, exactly. That, that, exactly what you just described happens all the time. Yeah, and yeah. All, additionally, I've heard, uh, I think I've heard you talk about this, but also other composers who are like doing, like making a living as a composer, like they, they really, like in order to get enough commissions to pay all the bills and stuff, they have to write a lot of pieces. <laughs> That's <laughs> and, right. And like a lot, a lot of music. And what better way to get training to do that than just like, from the very beginning, write tons of music all the time. Like, do it now. We're playing it on Friday. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, it, it sounds like a brilliant way to prepare for having a deadline at the end of the week or something. Yeah, like. I mean, it's, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you do. It's always working. It's always writing. And I have to have a schedule um, because it's for, I go from one piece to the next. It is a lot. It is a lot of, of writing to keep it going. But there's, there's also lots of performances yeah. of my music. And that, you know, I have over... That's pretty motivating. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's well over 500 performances a year of my music and and that goes up every year so just keeping keeping track of that and up on the people i have you know sending the music out and taking over the ordering my own writing um it's it it's you put all that together um you know it's not a lot but it's it's you know it can support a small family yeah do you do you do do your own publishing as well like i do i do which doubles my royalties so that's why i do it you know i've been approached by publishing companies before and right now i'm talking to one which i i won't say who it is but it, it's one of the, the sticking points i keep saying is i'm, I'm worried about losing i'm losing you know a lot i mean a lot of these public publishing companies are, are interested in me because of the amount of performances i have and they're looking at 500 performances a year which could be yeah. 600 soon and whatever and they're looking at it as a dollar sign but i'm looking at it as okay if they if they take that i lose half my royalties for that um for me, they need to double the amount of performances, and I just simply, who the heck's going to play my music seventeen hundred times a year? I don't think it's going to happen. So mm-hmm. I, I keep, I keep my own publishing rights um, because I'm greedy. I guess no, I mean I keep it because it, it's, <laughs> it, it, it helps. I mean all those things add together. Um, the selling the music, I, it's the other thing is I sell my, I don't, I don't rent the parts. Mm-hmm. I'm like, buy the music. You can play as much as you want. And I'm afraid if you know publishing companies start renting my music, performances may go down because it's going to get very expensive for them. Oh, sure. um, yeah. Yeah, so I sell it. People buy it. They can play as much as much as they want. That combined with royalties, CDs, mechanicals, dance licenses, film. I do film, film licenses, and then commissions all add up to to uh, to something. Yeah, it's, and that's something we don't we don't talk about. Like I don't know why. It's like I don't know why in school they don't really talk about that. But that's important information for a young composer to know that they can piece get, together a living. People get weird talking about money. Yeah. yeah. Like, I know. And, like we don't want to imagine that we we do this for anything other than what like some capital R romantic notions of of what composers do, really, or what, or what musicians do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and so and and like people don't like talking about that, especially right. in school where where everybody is is doing everything for free all the time anyway. Or at Beethoven festivals. Right. <laughs> Heyo. Heyo. Yeah, we talked about that a few weeks ago. Yeah. In in Chicago too, no less. I I was on the former board for the Beethoven Festival, so it was yeah that was, it was not good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so everyone's going to be paid. I, I I mean I I'm pretty sure everyone will be paid. Well, they that's little, good to know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they will. If they had, I don't know exactly what, but well, yeah. I think that we have to assume everybody's going to get paid if they want the festival to keep happening. Cause of, yeah, and right. it, you know, the they festival should... is so great, and that's the thing. The yeah. festival was pretty amazing, and to see that. I think it just grew too fast. I mean, it, it was, it grew really big, really quickly, and I think it just got unwieldy. And um, they were, I think, counting on money that that in the end wasn't there. And no, they well, may have to downsize. I'm not sure. I don't really know the details of it. I I was on the new music portion, which is a very small part. Likely, if they hadn't had to 
suffer through the economic downturn while they were trying to expand, things might have been right. a little different. But right. Right. hopefully they'll, they'll get everything worked out. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Sam. I don't want to, I don't want to talk about the baseball. That's what yeah, this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 This is just gonna, a downer. Let's talk about gonna, fun things, Sam. Let's talk about the news. Well, let's, let's break the order as I have listed and go ahead and talk about something really fun first. Okay. As a matter of fact, you might even say that this fun is mandatory. hey oh <laughs> hey -oh. Not so much an art music topic, but I couldn't resist uh, mentioning this this week. For the first time since 1963, a comedy album, although I think calling it a comedy album is not correct. A comedy album is uh, top of the Billboard 200. Is that what it's called? Yes. The um, album chart. Weird, Weird Al Yankovic's new release, Mandatory Fun, is uh, topping the charts, and there's all kinds of interesting marketing things. And I'm going to defer to the biz music business specialist to give us a quick Cliff Notes versions of version of how awesome it was when he released this album. Well, he just, okay. it's a number of there's a number of weird things and cool things that he did. Uh, he released uh, eight videos in eight days. He didn't tell anybody what they were going to be. Um, so he, he releases the album, and you can stream or buy the album already, and you, you didn't know what eight of those singles were, were, were going to get videos. And another interesting thing he did, he released each of the videos on a different platform. So one of them went up on uh, Nerdist, and one of them went up on Funny or Die, and one of them went up on, um, oh, I, I can't remember any of the other ones, but they all had those little windows of exclusivity. And part of the deal was those networks were funding the video production for the video that they got, which is really cool. Um, and uh, that allowed him to not have to spend that money himself, which is something artists usually have to, to, to pay for some or all of video production costs, uh, even, even, even for, for big people that have been doing it a while, like, like Weird Al Yankovic. Um, and, you know, Sam mentioned that this is the first time since the 60s there's been a, a so-called comedy album in, in the Billboard, at the top of the Billboard 200. This is Weird Al's first ever number one album, and he's been doing it for a while. Oh, wow. um, so it's really cool for, for him to, to finally get a little bit of recognition for that. Um, but like Sam said, it's not necessarily the normal, our normal beat, but it is an interesting thing in, in, in a guy using uh, new media in some, some interesting ways to, 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 to reach his audience and also to, to make ends meet, right? He, by, by partnering with all these different people and getting his music in, in every possible place it could be, um, he, was, he was not only sharing some of the value of his music, but also sharing some of the risk in a very socialist kind of way. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know. Anyway. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Sam? No, nope, that was it. I just wanted to point. I just wanted to be able to talk about Weird Al on our serious composer show more than anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now back to downer news. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter Gelb has sent out a letter to uh, everyone, all the fifteen, I think it is, unions that are involved in all the people that make the Met opera happen, saying that uh, brace for a lockout if things don't get solved because stuff, 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 stuff. And what he says, and the musicians, of course, don't think that his stuff is accurate. So basically this was a shot across the bow for the, uh, for the unions to see who blinks first. Well, um, when we're talking about the Met, we're not just talking about the, the musicians, right? Oh, no. So we got like the, the we got the players, we got the singers, we got all of the technical people, and a, a, the, a bunch of other unions. The uh, the like Lincoln Center, you know, I don't know what building staff, you know, the right. non artistic, but they actually picketed uh, outside Lincoln Center. I think it was this week um, when they when the when the letter was sent out, they actually had a picketing uh, presence at Lincoln Center to try and raise awareness. And the musicians, for their part, are saying that if Gelb goes through with this, that they will never trust him again. So, um, somebody, the the musicians are already slouching a bit towards a scorched, scorched earth policy, um, and we'll see. Um, we've there no shortage of contentious labor disputes in uh, the world of music. So, 
hopefully they'll be able to come to some kind of understanding, but something tells me that we'll be having friend of the show, Drew McManus on again sometime in the next month or so. <laughs> well, they got to do better than Bayreuth this week. Bayreuth yes. Festival had a really rough opening night. Um, they, they, they didn't have German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who has over the last few years attended the opening of the Bayreuth Festival. Um, and they had some major stage collapse issue. Some, something about the set broke in the middle of the performance and they felt that in order to safely deal with it, they had to clear the audience out of the hall. So everybody in the, in the room had to leave while they fixed it for like a half an hour and then come back. So an extra added half hour intermission in the middle of your Wagner um, will get you home pretty late. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, that has been, been a rough, rough, uh, rough couple of weeks for the opera world. Um, I'm sure they've got everything back on track now and, and Byron will run smoothly the rest of the time. Another really cool thing, uh, shifting back to new music, things that 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 we like um we've we may have talked about these, these these on the show before these animated scores they're made by uh, you see them on youtube everywhere the the main guy that's making them is a guy named steven malinowski uh who does s- m- these really cool animations that show uh, a visual representation of music happening kind of in a it's it's kind of music notation in that it's showing uh rhythm over time or pitch over time so you see lines go up and down as as different instruments come in and out um and it's a it's a really cool thing i've used them actually in my music appreciation classes where i'm teaching students who don't read notation and would be turned off by notation to to like identify a motive and say look at this this little squiggly thing this shape comes back over here or this this shape comes back here but it's it's changed in some way and that's like a really powerful thing to be able to have something to point to that you can say listen for this when this happens um and so he is is has a kickstarter right now um i haven't checked it this morning uh do we know what its status is but the kickstarter is to make some of these is it funded it is funded they've got 557 of the 550 that they were going for Awesome. So he was looking for funding just to just for the licensing, um, but he's doing these animated graphic scores for uh, the Nancaro player piano etudes, Conlon Nancaro's player piano etudes, which would be really amazing to see in this format um, which, because you, there's you... so much going on. Yeah, and it's when it's you... the kind of stuff that isn't even easily expressed in music notation because the the rhythms are so uh out there and the 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 strange meter things that he's i mean that's why he's doing player piano instead of a player at the piano because there's so many cognitive challenges that it's easier just to you know robot it in um Mm -hmm. and so it's a really cool thing yeah. yeah, and when you see how involved and how how beautiful, really, his animated scores, one of my favorites I put in the chat, Dave, is Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn, and I use them I use them in my fundamentals class, like just getting kids to connect a noise with something that they see on the screen, and then when they hear that motive come back, they see the shape again. It connects like a visual presentation to something they're hearing. Yeah. Um, and when you see how involved they are just for an orchestral score, thinking about doing one of those Conlon Nancaro pieces would be, not only do they need licensing, but it would be a tremendous amount of work. Because right. based on what I've seen from this guy before, I am, I'm imagining they're going to be pretty incredible looking. Mm-hmm. Um, and he doesn't always use the same scheme for sort of the visualization. It kind of right. he matches the visualization like a piano piece that doesn't have a lot of huge you know, 10 finger things going on, the nature of the animation will change um, to match a more, you know, contrapuntal line presentation or something. So really inventive. And all of his orchestral scores, he makes himself with a sample library, you know, technique. And for that kind of thing, they're really well done too. So they sound really nice too. And the orchestra plays perfectly in tune. I would love to, (laughs) I would love for him to do another Kickstarter like this to license some some real serious recordings to do these with because that was the only for me that was the only downside of using them in class was like we can use this animation thing but we're not going to listen to a great recording of beethoven when we do this this is this is just for the kind of constructive purposes of of the score and then we would listen to 
you know, like a Bernstein recording of Beethoven after that or something like that. Wow. So, so now, yeah, we charge our listening audience to go and fund this and maybe he'll get some serious recordings because there's 21 days to go. And uh, yeah, he's already got what he needs for the licensing that he was going to do. Maybe if he gets piles of money, then he can really get some nice recordings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what else I would like is is a long poster of the full <laughs> like roll of the of the score. So yeah. what you really want is just like the piano roll on your wall. Yeah, yeah, but his colorful version of the piano roll. Yeah. 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 Great. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, have you seen any of these things before, Mark? I have. They're incredible. Yeah. yeah. They're really, really amazing. And and so we're, we're really looking forward to, to seeing these now that we know they're going to be funded. And you have plenty of time to back it. If you are hearing the sound of my voice in the next 21 days as after I'm recording this, um, you can go to the Kickstarter project. And we'll, again, have a link to that in our show notes at soundnotion.tv slash SN where you can uh you can find Stephen and and help him make awesome things on the <laughs> YouTube. He needs Indeed. our help. Um is there any, oh. uh, sorry, Sam, what were you gonna say? Well I was gonna note this is normally the part of the show where we would say, and so and so and so and so passed away this week. And I think this is the first time in since I can remember and the thing is we're all there are worried. no relevant obituaries. <laughs> When we don't have any obituaries to cover, I'm always worried that we're missing somebody big, you know. Yeah. So, uh, as far as I can tell, the the music world didn't lose anybody of note. Yeah, it's a good <laughs> that's good yeah, I said that. And then yeah. Now gonna somebody's going to have their feelings some, hurt. <laughs> I'm going to get hate mail from somebody's cousin or something. Yeah, the estate of somebody is going to be like, oh man, we didn't make that's the sound right. motion cut. Oh, jeez. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I'm, everybody's worried about making the sound notion cut, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Well, <laughs> I think that's going to do it for this week's show. Did we have anything else that I'm forgetting? I want to yeah, make sure. Well, Go ahead, Nate. Well, Mark, I had one question. So we sure. talked about a, lot of, uh, a couple of your pieces, and uh, and the compositional process in particular was really interesting. And I, I loved hearing about the um, the new school that you're talking about putting together in a year. Um, it. How how will we be able to find that? Like, are, are we gonna? <laughs> is is there a name for it yet, or is it is does it have housing or anything? Or, yeah, I mean the the, the program I'm building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it is at the University of Illinois. It's Chicago, okay. and we Great. recently turned into a school of theater and music. So it's okay. a school of theater and music at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Wonderful. Cool. And so, so pe they, people can go to the UIC page and find it. Yeah, you'll find our general page for the, for for the music program now, and uh, and at some point this year we'll have things up about the new composition program. Composition program will start a year from this fall. Okay, okay. excellent. And you so we'll going to be some recruiting uh, hopefully this year for. for you, next you don't year. accept people that already have doctorates. <laughs> That'd be yeah, great. I, I only have a master's, so I'm totally good. Right? <laughs> yeah, no, we're super excited about it. It's going to be. I mean, I feel like it's a it's a place where I can really do the kind of program I've always wanted to do. And well, we, uh, we really. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, and it's and they're being that you know everyone is being very. The program is being very. Uh, the university has been super supportive of it too. So, um, yeah, we're we're excited. Well, when when that when that's coming up and getting ready to launch, we'd love to have you back on to talk about how how it's going because we yeah. like we really one of our one of our pet topics is, is is anybody who's listened to the listened to us before knows is educating new composers and and how we yeah. can do that better. And it sounds like this is a, a really great uh, place to go. And so we'd love to hear thank how you. you're doing it and how it goes. Thank you. Well, you can thank Bill Ryan for the inspiration. I mean. Bill Ryan's wow. program at GBSU is really the inspiration for what I'm trying to do at UIC. And I've talked to Bill extensively about how he built what he has there. And, and we're just going to try and copy as much as we can <laughs> for what yeah. Bill's done with the new music Absolutely. ensemble, of course. And, and as, good composers, as good composers do, you're going to copy the stuff you like and take That's credit right. for it. That's right. <laughs> Bill who? Yeah, yeah. never Bill heard who? of him. Yeah. Well, <laughs> anyone who teaches at a small school, as I do, <laughs> Bill Ryan is an inspiration for what you can make happen new music-wise oh, in yeah. an environment that you, you probably wouldn't guess that would become that strong of a new music presence in such a small pond, but he's pulled it off, so I'm going to pull it off here, too. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and one of my favorite composers alive today. I mean, Bill gets a lot of attention for what he's done with the new music ensemble and what he's done at the university, but as a composer... His music is just phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe me, listen to Blurred. 
Oh know, yeah, I think yeah, we smoke. we had Bill on the show, and that may have been the 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 pick we used of his. Um, but uh, yeah, or simple lines. I mean, he, he, yeah. the list. He, yeah, it's incredible stuff. So, um, well, it's it's great great to hear that you you're 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 doing all this cool stuff and working with all these cool people. Thank you so much for your time this morning, Mark. We really appreciate it. We had a we had a great great time talking to you. You know, guys, it was yeah. a real treat for me. Thank you. Thank well, you yeah. yeah, keep you, keep in touch. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll let you get back to the beach now too, if you. <laughs> Dogfish Head Brewery is right down the street. Oh, um, that's where I'm headed, and then the beach is right next to it. That's going to be my next week. So, yeah. I am jealous. This is my Brilliant. jealous face. Uh, that sounds wonderful, Mark. You you have a, a, a lovely afternoon and a lovely week at, at the Dogfish Head Beach Brewery. Um, <laughs> and and try not to think about the rest of us in, in less exciting places. I'll try um, for you. Yeah, have, have, have a Dogfish Head for us. We'll do um, it. <laughs> We'll have links to uh, all the things that we talked about with Mark today and, and all the, the, the other stories that we talked about today on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN, for, for you listening at home. If you want to read up on any of these other things, we would, we would love uh, for you to, to find those things and, and check them out. Uh, if you'd like to comment, we'd love for this conversation to continue as well. If you have any thoughts about uh, educating composers or, or, or working with uh, novel instrumental groups like, like string bands like Mark has done, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Again, soundnotion.tv slash SN. You can also connect with us on, on various social media platforms. We're on Twitter as a group as at SoundNotion. I'm at Dave McDow. Sam is at Housegoy. Nate is at Innate Tree. You can also connect with us on Facebook on Tumblr, on YouTube, uh, wherever you like to, to, to find your social media things. We're on, well, I shouldn't say we're even on most of them, but we're on a lot of them. Um, so, so check us out there. Um, if you uh, are, are interested at all in any of that, we'd love, we'd love to join that conversation with you there. You can find this show and all our shows at soundnotion.tv in the iTunes store, so be sure to go there and subscribe and catch every episode. Or, you know, if you're using your other thing, you can find us in a, in a lot of other places as well. We're on Stitcher, and, and, and if you just need the direct link, you can find those on our site. Um, if you'd like to support the, the shows, the best way to do that is to tell your friends, leave us positive reviews in the various places where you download the shows. Um, if you'd like to support us monetarily, you can do that by using our Amazon affiliate search on our site. Um, just the next time you're buying regular whatever stuff on Amazon, search for it through our little box on our site, and we'll get a little commission for directing you to Amazon. Doesn't cost you anything, but that helps us out a lot. Uh, and you can also leave us a donation there as well if, if you're feeling particularly generous. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again so much for watching or listening, and we'll be back next week. Weird Al. <laughs> <laughs>